So hello folks and welcome to another Tuesday night lecture. Uh, if this is your first time this evening, uh, we're the Mid Ulster Amateur Radio Club and we've been organising this for a number of weeks. It started way back when at the very start of the pandemic. Uh, you can find out more information about us as a club uh, at muarc.com and you can also check out our previous lectures on our YouTube channel. Uh, youtube.com forward slash m-u-a-r-c media so feel free to have a look at those this evening tonight uh, i'm going to hand over to george uh, who's uh, going to do a wee bit of introducing and we also have all the way from uh, the grand old states uh, of gordo gordo west or gordon uh, but george if you want to go from there you take it over over to you uh, thank you very much, Dave, and uh, very good evening to everyone. And uh, thank you very much, first of all, to uh, Gordon, or Gordo, as I believe you'd like to be called, for joining us this evening. Uh, we had a conversation, uh, Dave, myself, uh, and you uh, a few weeks back, and uh, we're really uh, pleased that you were able to come on and uh, give us a talk on emergency communications. Gordo, you've been uh, involved in amateur radio uh, for quite a while, and um, maybe you could give us a wee bit of background first on on your uh, history of amateur radio. Ah, unmute. Up in the United Kingdom, Ireland, Australia, over here in the lockdown United States, as most of us are throughout the world. Um, this is my uh, 50th plus year in ham radio, uh, teaching, writing books about um, uh, ham radio. And uh, my big mission is to uh, salute those that uh, helped us get started with our uh, different amateur radio services, all with a common goal of intercommunication, technical investigation, and uh, today, uh, Part of our roles here in the United States are part 97, 97.1 is emergency communications. And our ham radio service uh, began uh, many uh, years ago with uh, the invention of being able to get electrons to flow in a piece of wire and to convey information uh, with those electrons in a piece of wire. And it was 1835 that Samuel Morris uh, started experimenting at, with a telegraph by energizing current, uh, alternating current, in a conductor. And it was in 1844 that Samuel Morris sent a message from the United States, Washington, D.C., uh, about two to 300 miles via copper wire all the way to Baltimore, Maryland. Actually, he sent it up that way. And um, uh, that very first message looked like this. I know it may be a little hard to see, but uh, it uh, reads, what hath God wrought? Question mark. And that was in the clickety clickety uh, telegraph. And um, he uh, sent it to Mr. Ellsworth, who was uh, also there to receive it. So that was one of the first real communication needs, one way uh, from uh, one uh, state to another via wires. <clears throat> Over in your neck of the woods, you were doing something even more intense, and we owe our radio history to you right there in the United Kingdom where you were making great strides in being able to send wireless radio calls. And it was in 1865 that your Marconi, and again here from this great book is a picture of Mr. Marconi, Marconi, an Italian was sending wireless and attempting to get a message not only down and up along uh, uh, your coastlines, 
but try to transatlantic England to Newfoundland, and he accomplished that in 1899. Well, that's really when they said, you know, rather than uh, burn up all these wires and have to worry about solar storms and auroras and telegraph keys that started sparking and burning down wireless stations, let's do this thing via radio waves. The shipping industry in the 1900s thought that ham radio, excuse me, uh, all radio, of which the hams were there experimenting even without a license, that all radio waves carried great importance. But it didn't really come to fruition for wireless to be a lifesaver until that day, April 1912. And that is when the Titanic collided with an iceberg and the radio operators sent out this message. And I'm sure all of you are CW wise. You can imagine via spark gap, uh, the uh, uh, vessels uh, nearby, a couple hundred miles nearby, uh, were picking up this call. That, of course, was during the time the CQD, which is the distress call, and later on they turned it into SOS. But unfortunately, closer vessels had already closed down for the evening as the Titanic was frantically sending out this CQD. So in 1912, well after the Titanic disaster, uh, there were rules and regulations put in place. And one of them was on future uh, sojourns via the ocean, two operators had to be on duty. So they were covering the spark gap signals uh, 24 hours a day. Well, we went through the 1900s uh, with uh, radio improving, and there were so many radio experts. Galvani, Volta, Ostrid, Ampere, Faraday, Morris, Hertz, Tesla, Popov, Marconi, and in uh, the uh, 1900s, uh, many of the um, um, emergency groups uh, uh, started saying, we need a way of being able to wirelessly communicate with each other. So it was radio that uh, has played such an important part for both your country as well as here in the United States. And some of the radio calls are uh, recorded here. Uh, most of them are via ham radio because as ham radio operators, we know the value of radio. We love the lure of being able to operate off of batteries, uh, off of homebrew antennas. We love meeting new folks as our fraternity of trained radio operators, but in an emergency, we're always ready to work with our served agencies, our police and fire departments, when we may have traffic that sounds like this. Six MSI, Tango Shelter Delta. Fire is spreading over to Country Club Drive rapidly. Five homes are in immediate danger. We need evacuation now of these homes. A copy of that. Be advised that uh, the Sheriff's Dispatch is activating the CERT team at this time for the evacuations, and the water company has been notified. Also, Public Works. Part of that conversation was the CERT team has been organized. Here in the United States, we have a government-sponsored community emergency response team network. These are not necessarily hams, but just citizens that like to come together and help out in a widespread emergency. And we train many of these citizens that are good with their little tiny no license radios that go about a quarter mile, which is fine for a local search and rescue, 
But uh, we train them, if they have an interest in radio, to maybe get their ham radio license. Because when the fires break out here in Southern California, in the United States, on the Pacific Coast, they are funneled by high winds that come out of the Pacific Ocean to our west. And we have calls. Break, break. Four homes on Country Club engulfed in flames. We require further resources, and we still have no uh, water pressure at this time. Central County Fire Copy uh, resources from the original fire ground are being redeployed to those areas. Uh, uh, helicopters are incoming to make water drops on those structures. Wow. Now that was done on our amateur radio two meter band. Here in the United States, our allocation is 144 to 148 megahertz on the two meter band. Many times when there are fires, we have two meter ham radio operators that are sent to the top of hills to overlook and report the fire but there's one thing working against them, and I know you've got it there in England because Susie and I have been to your country, wind. Listen to what wind does on most ham radio handhelds to occlude a conversation. I'm not sure what the fire was. The smoke was well, still continuing. Wow. Uh, wow, that was impossible to hear, wasn't it? Well, that's wind noise. So we encourage all of you that are in the training of emergency radio operators on a real windy day, uh, let them listen to themselves on a recording, as you heard there, and uh, see what happens when wind is coming over their speaker microphones or possibly their headset. It's a real problem. About 20 years ago, uh, we had a series of hurricanes, and these hurricanes usually uh, come from Africa, uh, travel over through the Bahamas, and then work their way up into uh, the Florida panhandle. And our water in those regions is extremely warm, about 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and I'll let George figure it out for centigrade. Right, George? You got it? Anyway. <laughs> Well, whatever it is, it's almost bath water, but it's not good water for those in a hurricane. So let's now go from our two meter bands that we both share over to high frequency. This is high frequency on 20 meters. I'm on the Pacific coast, and this is happening um, along the Gulf Coast in the state of Louisiana. The hurricane name, I'm sure you've heard it, is called Katrina, and it was a bad one. Roger, we had about three inches of rain since last night. About three inches of rain since last night. That guy sounds a little stressed out, doesn't he? He is. We don't have any electricity. Uh, the whole block is out. Ooh. That's actually good for ham radio operators. No electricity. The whole block is out. <laughs> Don't you love it when everybody's blacked out and you're still going with your ham set and all your batteries? Right. Uh, and the winds, I'm estimating, were gusting up, up over 50. Uh, we have broken branches lying around. And uh, I wanted to say uh, I'm at 29 yes, my position. Wow. Well, at uh, 50 miles an hour, uh, they were really taking a pounding, as you could hear. Well, about uh, 50 miles away in a small town called Slidell, they had a National Weather Service station that depended on commercial single sideband transmissions on commercial channels. The Weather Service all of a sudden went off the air and they made a call uh, with one of the hams there to fellow hams to drive over with their vehicles and back them up on the air with emergency comms. So listen to the call about the weather station. Okay, I'm getting a report from Alpha Delta 5, Delta Papa, uh, that the National Weather Service in Slidell has lost all HF radio operations. Over. They lost all their HF propagation and their radios 
because the weather blew the roof off the weather service. Can you imagine that? Well, um, the hams came in there and uh, supported them, and uh, they gave the weather station now a new lease on life with their uh, comms to back them up. But meanwhile, another hundred guys. Losing trees, it gets worse. But everybody thought New Orleans, the big city of New Orleans, how many have been to our New Orleans? Let me see you all wave your hands. All right. Oh, a bunch of you. Okay. Well, we know New Orleans, and everybody thought the hurricane had missed this major city because we didn't hear anything from them. No news is not good news. The next morning, a ham operator with a hustler antenna drove to the top of a parking garage in New Orleans, and everybody thought, hey, New Orleans, you're okay. New Orleans is shut down. New Orleans has got major destruction, and uh, they've got the roof off the Superdome. They've got uh, water in the business district. They've got, uh, you probably know better from the... Uh, from the national TV coverage than we do. We have no TV. All we have is... Uh, is uh, All we have are the ham radio services, and it was great. So Hurricane Katrina helped out a bunch, and the hams actually have a position at the National Weather Service Hurricane Center in Miami. There's we are information. transferring uh, information to the National Hurricane Center, and uh, that helps the uh, forecasters to uh, predict uh, landfall and uh, tracking of the hurricane. Okay, so with that said, uh, are there any stations uh, on the southwest coast of Florida that have hurricane strength winds? At the and the Miami Hurricane Center has a, a Telrex, and many of you are familiar with the broadbanded Telrex log periodic antenna. Uh, they've got it on a massive tower, and so far it has survived every hurricane that actually went over the Miami area. You can tune them in when here in the United States we're having hurricanes in the Gulf or to our uh, east coast on 14 decimal 325 kilohertz. 14 325 upper sideband. Well, it happened in New York City. Not a hurricane this time, but something even more grave. The first ham that was witnessing what was occurring in New York City could not even talk he or she pressed the microphone, and in the background, all we could hear was this. And then another ham came on, and from capture effect, through the repeater, was able to relay this message. The repeater was high atop one of the World Trade Center tower. The World Trade said that tower number one is on fire. The whole outside of the building was just a huge explosion. The World Trade Center building number one is on fire. We have a number of floors on fire. It looked like the plane was aiming towards the building. Transmit a third along. We'll have the staging area at the possession at West Street. Have the third alarm assignment go into that area. Set the alarm assignment report to the building. Okay. So. The problem there in those communications, there was so much noise in the background. So for those of you that are teaching your uh, European partners ham radio techniques, one is on the two meter and the 440 band and uh, other frequencies, is make sure that your speaker headset is properly adjusted. And that, of course, is where Bob Heil We'll talk a lot about his uh, headsets that are really uh, great for not picking up too many sounds away from uh, the voice. Well, a few years later, when you, what else could happen to the East Coast? They have something, and I don't know if you get a bunch over your neck of the woods, but we certainly do over here. 
earthquakes. Um, uh, horizontal motion lasted approximately 10 to 15 seconds. Very light. Over. Well, it was fairly light, but it was enough to cause the Washington Monument to sway and began losing some of its structure. So, wow, earthquakes even on the East Coast. Out here in Southern California, we get earthquakes uh, almost uh, weekly, uh, not necessarily in downtown L.A., but when we do have an earthquake in downtown L.A., the hams are ready to come on the air usually on the two meter band through a couple of repeaters that they have uh, designated as the repeaters to go to when something big happens like an earthquake and listen to this report, a good report. KD6 MVD for a damage report on a freeway. MVD, go ahead with the damage report on freeway. By the way, ladies, you make great radio operators because your voice is always clear, you're nice and relaxed, and you can help us out on the roadway when we give you the report. Roger, four miles uh, north of um, Demonstrator on the 405 is quite a bit of buckling in two different places and a lot of rough, rough concrete up, but so you got to go through there real slow. So this is a wonderful report that he's giving, not about the damage to the freeway and concrete that's up and buckling, but rather to other ham operators going, well, I guess I'm not going to go that way at 5 in the morning. Listen to what else happened at 5 in the morning from this earthquake that was over 150 miles away from where this station is reporting this. All right, I want all of you to listen carefully, and we'll give you two shots at it, but let's see if you can hear what this mobile station is saying on the two-meter band. Freeway 10, and what section? That will be eastbound and westbound. Near Washington, the bridges are down. The what? Let's try that one again. Say again your message. That will be Holy smoly, the bridges are down. These are freeway overpasses that have collapsed on the freeway below. Major. Well, it was ham radio miles away from the actual center of the earthquake that uh, is uh, reporting that the bridges are down. Wow. Now, more reports come in. This one's interesting. Here's a ham on 75 meters. How many of you operate 75 meters? Let me see your hands. Just give me a wave. 75 meters. Do you have 75 meters allocation? We yeah, have. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I lost your audio there for a second, George, but uh, try it one more time. Okay. All right. Um, I lost in there for a second. Um, am I still coming through okay, Dave? Okay, yeah. great. Anyway, um, yeah, there, now we got you. Go oh, ahead. All right, okay. Yeah, we have uh, 80 meters, uh, 3.5 to 3.8 megahertz. Uh, you go on up to uh, above 3.8 in the States. Up to 4 megs. Okay, up to four megs. We have pretty much the same allocation. There, the sky wave is quite steep, so we're able to both ground wave and sky wave stay in touch with other operators during these earthquakes. And guess what? If the earthquake is coming from the south and a station down south of where we're located says, oh my gosh, you should feel that. I haven't felt anything because earthquakes travel at the speed of sound in a solid. Well, that means electromagnetic waves traveling at the speed of light are going to say, whoa, do you feel that? No, because your slow earthquake hasn't hit here yet, and then bingo, it happens. Uh, they said that the quake was felt first in Westchester, then it was felt a few seconds later in Thousand Oaks. A report on from 80 meters. Uh, 
So um, earthquakes in Southern California, we now have seismic monitors. We used to have them on the air. They'd be a continuous tone. And when the tone warbled, it meant that a distant earthquake sensor was picking up a big one. Uh, to keep the tone from driving you nuts 24 hours a day, we'd use digital signal processing. Most rigs come now with DSP, and we'd just notch it out as a beat cancel. But as soon as it would warble, it would uh, fall out of the DSP's passband, and we'd hear it loud and clear. Um, so anyway, yes, we're uh, tuned into earthquakes. In Long Beach, it uh, lasted several seconds. We had a couple things fall down, and the bird went crazy. And the bird went crazy. Well, that's good to know. The question is, did it go crazy before the earthquake so we could have told it? We don't know. Well, this is still in some of here for years. Uh, sort of an east-west, but so, some vertical motion. And there was two peaks, uh, a little bit at first, then a big peak. So ham radio calls get through loud and clear, especially when a lot of the cell systems may fall out of alignment. Uh, they're all um, uh, interconnected uh, many times via uh, uh, microwave frequencies. And uh, these microwave frequencies, boy, that dish has got to be right on the nose. And after an earthquake, uh, they begin to lose cellular. So that's why it's important for hams to be ready. Well, just when we thought we're ready for anything, this call comes over a station uh, uh, in um, Hawaii indicating that Japan just had a major earthquake. Well, earthquakes travel via a tsunami. That is a earthquake water wave. The tsunami is not a big breaker, but rather it's like an extremely high tide. And I know in the UK, you get some pretty big tides. Nothing like a tsunami, uh, 10 to 15 feet. And when that tsunami hits Hawaii, guess what happens to a ham reporting Hilo? Listen to this, just amazing. Just an update from the Big Island of Hawaii. It's been reported that the, uh, the water is receding in Hilo too on the breakwater as well as, as at a couple of the beaches. So I just passed the information along. I'm on the southern end and uh, that's the report from Hilo, Hawaii. That's the net page of our And then of course, all the tourists go down, they're going, hey, where'd the water go? Let's get in there real close and examine all the fish flapping around in the, uh, in the marsh. And then they go, uh-oh, here comes the water back. And of course, that is the tsunami all the way from uh, Japan. Um, let's go back to the two meters. And here's another report. And again, ladies, you always have the best voice. This one was serious. This one was real serious, what she was reporting. See if you can catch the call. Oh my gosh, there's a school bus with kids on it and it's like 50 yards south of Falls Canyon on Avalon Canyon Drive. We a report from uh, ham operators at scene on the number of patients that might be involved at Control Choir. Would you check with our hospital resources and advise them of the number of casualties and be advised? So in a rural area on an island off the coast of Southern California, a school bus has collided. It's on its side. Kids are injured. One of the hams comes on the air and says that one of the students needs immediate evacuation and needs an immediate transfusion of a very special medication that he is going to spell phonetically. So that's why in our ham classes that I teach, we always make sure the students know the phonetic alphabet. Because try this word, non-phonetic. We uh, need some medication for one of our trap car victims and want to know if you have five milligrams of amaldipine acetylate. I spell Alpha, Mike, Lima, Oscar, Delta, India, Papa, India, November, Echo, next word, Bravo, Echo, Sierra, Yankee, Lima, Alpha, Tango, Echo, five milligrams. Wow, that's great. I can't even say that word. But the hospital did have it. And as the hospital was preparing for the uh, uh, incoming of the students that were injured, uh, one of the ham operators 
uh, asked the bus driver, uh, you know, how did you flip on your side? He said, well, this car came around the corner and cut us off and I, we turned over. You mean another car was involved? Really? The Where? bus collided with a car that we just discovered halfway down the hill at Falls Canyon and Avalon Canyon. It is overturned on the south side of Avalon Canyon Drive. Two occupants are trapped. We need the jaws of life. Both occupants are alive but severely injured. W6 KLA. Wow. So now they got two more coming into the hospital. So a ham in the local vicinity of the hospital who has been trained to, in and a widespread emergency, go to the hospital. These are called hospital ham disaster groups. And they are so supportive of our local hospitals. When big things happen, uh, the hams wanted to make sure that the hospital could take all of these kids that were injured on this island. The hospital is near capacity with ER teams still able to take unrelated cases. Well, that's good news. They're at capacity, but they're still able in the ER to take uh, more uh, cases. And this is a big problem throughout the world with all of our hospitals absolutely at capacity with COVID patients. Um, the HAMS many times will uh, report to uh, the receiving area with their uh, protective mask on and so on. Very important that if they're doing a hospital run, that uh, they have all of their personal protection equipment. HAMS on the 20 meter band, 14300 Pacific Seafarers Net, which I know you hear over there as well early in your morning. Uh, HAMS late in the afternoon on Christmas Day heard this relayed call that causes chills up and down our spine. Listen to this. Sri Lanka reports 31,000 casualties with ocean waters covering all southern and eastern coastlines. The estimate is 800,000 homeless and in need of medical supplies. Ham radio operators need it immediately with high frequency radios. So our question is, is the ham radio community in Europe prepared that if you need to Take along your grab-and-go kit. You've got all of your ham equipment that will reach out on HF. Well, on high frequency, uh, we heard uh, one group uh, reporting about Hurricane Sandy. And this was a hurricane a few years ago that came up the east coast of the United States uh, with winds. Well, you tell me how strong they say the winds are of this hurricane, Sandy. Sure. Maximum sustained winds are near 135 miles per hour with higher gusts. Some fluctuation in intensity. Do you get it? 135 miles per hour. Woohoo! That's some pretty big wind out here uh, on our east coast. Not only is the wind a problem, but the storm surge is from Sandy. Is your storm surge is greater than six feet and hard to measure, uh, QSL? QSL. Storm surge higher than six feet. Wow. And this was at high tide where all of the water poured into the New York City uh, downtown subway, flooding the subway at the tip of uh, New York. So wow, wow, wow. Back to ham radio operators. How many hams have been dabbling with APRS? If I could just see your hand sort of wave. Automatic position reporting system. Yeah, that new Kenwood, that new Yezu, that new ICOM, they all have built-in GPS receivers. And the beauty of the GPS receiver during a hurricane is the United States Coast Guard aeronautical helicopters coming in for evacuations, they can't spot 3rd and Main Street. No, but they go because there is no more 3rd and Main Street sign. <laughs> There's no signs left. But GPS, Global Positioning System, via Automatic Position Reporting System, also called Automatic Packet, 
reporting system. Uh, the GPS uh, that the ham signals uh, back to the net control, they can see exactly where the helicopter is, if there's a ham on board, and where the ham is. Listen to the uh, Coast Guard. They were, the Coast Guard was sending somebody in there at, uh, as soon as they could expedite that. Roger. And they were doing that via GPS. Uh, I want the net to know that the 21 people at Fair Street has been uh, received by the Coast Guard, and they are acting on it. Uh, uh, no, no calls on that one. That is done, uh, Dave. So here were 21 people stuck on a roof, and the Coast Guard evacuated them. But some of the other hams didn't realize Anybody that. in New Orleans can report or get some action for these people. And all hams were called for Katrina, as you can hear. Yeah, anybody here. in New Orleans can help these people. Is there anybody I can relay? I heard somebody. Come out. Literally pleading for any ham with the right equipment and the right protection equipment to come on out and help. Here in the United States, we have a Federal Emergency Management Association team. Uh, these are uh, men and women that have emergency skills. They're not necessarily hams, but they came up with their high frequency agile radio on a ham radio 40 meter channel and the net control when they discovered that the November Foxtrot 7 Lima Kilo was not a ham call sign, the net control wisely said, I'm, this is a declared emergency, any station check in, licensed uh, as ham or federal. Hey, So he's talking to the FEMA van, and that was good. Well, before we sign off from the audio here, uh, a final on New Orleans. And here is the one and only station that survived Hurricane Katrina with enough signal on the 20-meter ham radio band. He was on 14.320, 14320. 5 kilohertz down from 325, the National Hurricane Center. And you can hear his desperation on the 20-meter band saying what they need from fellow hams to help them Tell out. The crews that come, if they're coming to uh, work on the towers, that they will need uh, generators and uh, fuel for the generators. And uh, basically, they're, they're, in essence, hitting the beach with no... Uh, no facilities to support them. No facilities to support them. Recommend they bring all of their own food and all of their own uh, creature comforts. QSL? QSL, right. I'm So the word uh, was out that if you're coming to Hurricane Katrina ravaged New Orleans, you got to bring... Any uh, support effort from fire departments, Coast Guard, telephone companies coming down, we, we deeply appreciate it, and we thank you, and hope we, uh, we're in your prayers. W2MIA. So ham radio plays such an important part in emergencies. We regularly train for emergencies out here in the United States. The American Radio Relay League, similar to RSGB, the American Radio Relay League has certification where folks take online emergency courses and uh, hone their skills. But you know, it's really the big skill is the ham operator themselves that has got everything well prepared ahead of time. Their grab and go bag is ready to be grabbed to get going to the emergency scene. So let's just hope all of us throughout the world get over and out of this pandemic. Let's hope that all of you are safe and you mask up and suit up anytime you're outside with a lot of other folks that may not have uh, the same feeling that they need to be protected. Um, and we look forward to hearing you on HF when bands get a little bit better. And by the way, Solar Cycle 25, Yahoo! We are going to uh, have a great solar cycle, judging by the amount of sunspot activity we have. 
So from the West Coast of the United States, uh, we uh, say hi to all of you and the United Kingdom and Europe and Ireland and Australia and USA. Every time we uh, think about all of you hams over there, we remember the Marconi book that says where everything began was right there in your part of the country. So I'll now turn it back to uh, whomever, and I can take a few questions. And again, thank you all for showing up tonight for our ham radio and emergency comms. Gordo, WB6, November, Oscar Alva, QRZ. <laughs> fantastic, Gordo, fantastic. Um... Uh, I could have listened to that for for another hour, uh, and I didn't even notice that time going in. Um, what we'll do, if you're happy enough, we'll take a few questions. Um, I'm going to kick us off, uh, and then if there's lots of people with questions, when I see you, I'll sort of call on you. To, so you'll have to wave your hands or something. But what I would ask is that people just introduce themselves with their first name and their call sign. So, Gordo, you know me, Dave, 2 i 0 SOE, And my question is, when it comes to emergency comms, and you might have touched on this a wee bit, is it the quality of the training that makes a good comm operator, or is it natural talent? Um, you know, I think it's almost natural talent for some folks not to panic, raise their voice, and scream in the microphone. We do try and train that. In fact, we play them some of these audios. I have other audios that I record here. And you're in my uh, ham radio shack that you can see in the background. And uh, those are folks screaming in the mic. I don't play them openly uh, except uh, now and then at training sessions because they're a bit embarrassing. Uh, so it takes both training, but you know, we find that ladies Ladies are always so calm. My wife, Susie, in six golf lima foxtrot, when I'm tearing my hair out that something has gone wrong here, uh, they are so calm. So, <clears throat> ladies, uh, we want you uh, to be uh, out there as well or as net controls because you have uh, that nice, relaxed, what it takes to handle an emergency. Great stuff, absolutely. Okay, if anyone has any questions there, feel free to raise their hand or so I can uh, see is there. Uh, okay, Graham, go ahead. All right, um, I am quite a fan of the JS8 call uh, digital mode, uh, that kind of thing is what I like to play. Have you started using um, digital modes like that to do uh, emergency things? You still stick into CWM voice? Yes, uh, Graham, emergency calls um, are best relayed to a central net control via FT8 or PSK or Olivia or many of the HF digital calls. We also have many that are using the Yezus Fusion, the ICOM D-Star, as well as some of the uh, digital uh, radio systems uh, that are out there. Uh, these take very special skills in how they route through the digital network. So yes, indeed, digital is the very big part of amateur communications, but it really takes those that well understand their computer, their messaging capabilities, the format that the message needs to be in if it's going to be sent to a federal agency. And uh, not everyone has that skill. Um, my skill is HF and VHF and voice, and I'm, I'm fair with digital messaging thanks to my Coast Guard auxiliary training. And uh, it's a special skill, Graham, that you raise, but it's an effective one because you're able to send uh, relatively confidentially over the air a long list of shelter occupants uh, that you would not want to voice over the normal airways for everybody, including the news service, to hear. Fair enough, thank you. Okay, anyone else have uh, any questions there? I would just like, uh, Frank, GI8MOV, I would just like to ask, um, have you got any 
radio equipment there, like a little hand portable or something that you would take in an emergency? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, the HF portable station, I should have probably uh, brought it out here, is an ICOM 706, which is absolutely a fantastic rig because of my Coast Guard auxiliary on federal frequencies. It's easily modified uh, for that. And it's in a, um, a carrying case uh, in the back. And the batteries we use are bio -ino. And the battery is non-spillable. It is not lead acid. And the lithium iron phosphate chemistry gives you a 13.8 voltage uh, until the battery is 90% exhausted. Unlike a wet cell or a sealed lead acid where the voltage will continue to track down, low voltage on HF leads to obvious distortion. Uh, so the whole battery package is about a 15 pound package, uh, including the ICOM 706 and uh, a series of dipoles because in an emergency, we can usually find something left standing for a dipole or I even have vice grips so that I can vice grip for a ground plane, a metal can or a metal vehicle that's upside down. And I have a telescopic made by MFJ in California, uh, excuse me, MFJ in Mississippi, a telescopic whip that will go to 33 feet. So I'm covered uh, 10 meters all the way through 40 meters. And if I need 75 meters, I'll wrap some wire around the tip top and run it over there and hope my tuner will tune it. Yes, what's portable the, HF important. What's the average battery life then in that situation? Okay, let me show you. Hold on. Hold on. Here's the bio -ino. This one's 20 amp hours, and uh, it is uh, 240 watt hours. It weighs about six pounds, very, very light. I mean, this is a light battery, and its voltage is about four, uh, 14.2 on charge. It's got a charge controller built in, and it's made by bio -ino, and they're here in California. I'm spelling bio -ino, B as in boy, I-O-E-N-N-O, -N -N power. And the chemistry is lithium, iron, phosphate, nothing to spill. And as you can see, very lightweight, and it'll last uh, three thousand recharges as opposed to maybe 300 that you could get out of a lead acid battery. Only thing you want to do though is not hit it with an overcharge. It won't kill it but it will cause the circuit to trigger and you have to reset it very easily done to get the voltage back. <clears throat> but bio -ino, a, a wonderful company, tell them you saw this uh, and their bio -ino power uh, on the internet. Tell them you uh, saw this on our um, uh, podcast today, our Zoom cast, and they give a significant discount to amateur operators. So that's the battery that we use for all sorts of different things. I have a 40 amp as well, but this one is so light that when I'm doing my microwave work, uh, this is the battery I use. And I put goo over the hot and the black uh, leads just to protect it in case something metal should come across it. So that's why the strange looking uh, terminal connection. Good, good, good preparations there. There's a few stories of uh, amateurs using batteries with uh, Yagi's touching the, the points there and, and creating a car fire. The person is in the chat here, but I won't point them out too much. Gordo, we have a question here from the chat as well. Uh, Ian and Esther, who's call signer GI0AZA and then GI0AZB ask, does the emergency organization, the emergency system in California there or the States have recognized identity cards? So in the UK, uh, our organization is called RayNet, the Radio Amateur Emergency Network, but that's, we carry identifi identification cards that are organized or, or uh, recognized 
by the UK government as an official emergency. Uh, we call them uh, a service, you know, first responders type type service. So is there anything like that? And then once you finish that question, Simon there, I've seen you waving. If you ask your question, and we have a couple more in the chat for you after that. Okay. I would like to say that we have an ID card that'll get us everywhere. We hardly have any card that will get us anywhere. The problem is every city in our uh, country has their own emergency manager and used to be half of them were hams. We were in, we'd get a city ID card and so on. But now uh, emergency managers uh, tend to have uh, great training, but few are hams. And if you go into a city to help out and there's not a ham radio group that serves that city, no amount of ID, no amount of emergency patches is really going to get you uh, in and uh, at the scene handling emergency comms. So our American Radio Relay League saw that and they're making a valiant effort through the Amateur Radio Emergency Service, A-R-E-S, trademarked by the A-R-R-L, uh, that um, uh, we do have some authorization. But let me tell you, it's not there yet. So it's really a job that as ham operators, we go to our local municipality, our local city, including the state government, and say, Hams are important, yet um, it's a tough sell these days because they go, yeah, stand back and uh, we'll call you when we need you. Uh, don't hold your breath because they have uh, backups to digital comms, P25. They got satellite comms and uh, they rely so heavily on the internet and cell phones that Unfortunately, we've been relegated to other things. But as you heard on the uh, transmissions earlier, uh, back then, uh, hams were very, very well received at the emergency scene. But it's getting tougher and tougher because of all the great communications that cities and states and county and our entire country have via satellite, via microwave, via mesh network. Uh, we're trying hard with our mesh networks to say, yeah, but we can give you a video. Uh, that sort of has their attention. But when 5G uh, gets going, everybody will have video. So we got to work hard to let our city know, our county know, our state know, and our country know that as hams, we can do a lot of stuff, maybe just making hot water for more coffee for the fire personnel, but don't lock us out because we got some radios that uh, can work around anytime someone is out of cell coverage. And that's great and, and fantastic. Um, locally over here in Northern Ireland, go to um, our local county. So almost like our states within Northern Ireland are beginning to partner up with our radio amateur emergency network folks, our oh, groups, good. and they are actually installing repeaters that are on standby constantly. If there is an emergency or are needed for health and safety reasons, when our amateurs get mobilized and on the repeater is there it's ready to go so that's starting to spread out across northern and it's fantastic um terrific same in there uh you had a wee question go ahead let's un let's unmute the mic so i've been doing zoom meetings all all evening so so apologies for not being out earlier and feeling a little bit miffed because i should be where you are now gordon um I would normally be over there for the sweepstakes. Uh, my other call is N1XIH. Um, oh, okay, I, I know I, you. I, I, I've got to defend my uh, uh, my portable operation in Utah because I normally win that bit. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but we're not allowed out. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you for thank you for being there. You've you've sort of described um, it being a lot tougher, and with the new rules in the states where they are pushing to have a proper FEMA. Um, uh, a com new communication system, a new digital one. Um, uh, <clears throat> sorry about that. 
I've lost my train of thought. So, sorry. <laughs> um, no, it, it is it is a tough sell yeah. because they see ham radio as volunteers. Yes. And each municipality says, "Oh yes. my gosh, volunteers! You know they're liable to, and then will be sued." And yes. it's better just to keep the volunteers. You know, you work uh, work the canteen, but don't even yeah. get near whatever. Yeah. So it's yeah. a problem that as volunteers, our country yeah. has really stepped back from volunteerism, except for right now yeah. during COVID. Yeah. We have so many volunteers yeah. delivering meals, delivering uh, turkeys for mm. Thanksgiving. Uh, it's heartening. And the hams are working with those volunteers to uh, pass traffic on uh, where to go next for uh, delivering uh, five more cases of food yeah. for the needy. Yeah. So hams are working in. But it's our job as hams to say, we can do that. Let us help you. You get rid of those little tiny toy walkie talkies and let us work with you. And by the way, we're free. Yes. Yes. It's, um, um, we've had a little bit of a problem on that in that, um, our constraints of actually moving about, um, before we went into the first lockdown, um, I was given a bit of, um, leeway and, I ordered and got a number of repeaters up and running for crosslinks through my country. Um, technically, we're a number of countries t together. Uh, um, but, um, yeah, and I, I thought when you sort of said about Europe, one of the issues we have, a little bit like my country is, as such, is the difference in languages. Um, we've always sort of said, um, uh, and where where's where's the us in effect is 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 in most cases one language as such yeah yeah uh, that's that's a real problem we have mainly just um uh those that speak uh spanish yeah uh, uh and there are a few other languages and there are ham groups that we know of that work with those groups. And the police departments that are mostly English speaking uh, are very happy to have the hams there as a translator. Excellent point that you raise. Yeah, it's, um, uh, it's, uh, and one thing to, just a quickie, you, you, the spelling of the medical. Um, we did do an exercise where we specifically did it that if you got the spelling wrong, the drug was different and it killed you. Uh, yep, yep. Do you know what I mean? But, but it was so, if you, we, we, we found a drug which if you spelt it wrong, you got a totally different drug, not a, not a, a misspelling, but you got a totally different drug. Oh, wow. Um, and that was the way we could tell whether it was correct or not. Yeah, well, the patient goes. <laughs> which, is, which, is, which is where uh, where the phonetic alphabet then comes uh, really into uh, into great use there. Um, Les, uh, are you okay to ask your question there? And then we have a couple more still go to in the chat if you don't mind. Uh, there's a few people have asked questions through that. Yeah, no problem. I have a radio net I need to go to in about 20 minutes, so we're good though. Okay, great. Gordo, fantastic um, uh, presentation. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, my Les. Question is, my question is about um, how do you make the decision to go 100 watts plus a battery or QRP plus a battery? You know, what is the, where is the balance in emergency services? Um, our balance is really training folks how to manage their power output and that max power output will undo the amount of time they're going to be on the air. So we do training on the two meter band and we do training on HF. And on the two meter band, we instruct everybody to go to low power, not extremely low, but low power in that we're usually working through a repeater that can hear uh, signals down to, you know, about one microvolt before they uh, begin to pick up background noise, maybe 10 microvolts per meter for background noise. On high frequency, uh, we tell them that if the station with whom you're communicating with is coming in 10 and 20 over S9, 
line and pull your power back to a minimum of 25 watts. But if they're just above the noise, uh, you better start at 50 watts and uh, move forward. So we try and have our uh, emergency responders sort of read the conditions and not just blindly go in there with their HT on high power where that HT might last two hours if they're doing a lot of talking. And um, same with the headsets, to manage the headset, because except for the Heil headsets, many of the imported headsets not designed by Kenwood, Yezu, Icom, and Alinko and the others, many of them, uh, the mic uh, audio is just really too hot, and it picks up all the background noise. So uh, we're cautious to try them out on a spectrum um, service monitor and make sure that they're down about three to four kilohertz, no more. Good, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Gordo, Peter, uh, LB0K, uh, I'm going to lump two questions together if you don't mind. Uh, you didn't mention WinLink in, in your operation. Have you? Do you use it? Have you heard of it? Is there anything like that? And then regards to training, uh, Steve there asks, how are things being handled during the COVID lockdowns? Are teams still training or using Zoom or voice nets? Okay. And what was the first mode? Uh, were you speaking of when whiskey in November or uh, some yeah, of the other? Wh yeah, whiskey in the November uh, and then link, win link in your operations. I don't know if you've. Uh, oh, yes. Question, you know. Yes, WinLink is very popular, uh, especially with our American Red Cross, as well as uh, hospital disaster groups, uh, WinLink, and um, it is an excellent mode, and we do it both uh, Win More on the 2 meter 440 bands and WinLink on HF. So yes, and I, I should have mentioned that uh, as one of the digital modes. So yes, indeed, uh, WinLink is popular. And say again, uh, the uh, second question our uh, viewer had. Yeah, with regards to actual uh, the quest, uh, the the training of the emergency comms and the teams, is it being managed throughout the the lockdown? I know folks are very active there already, but are you using Zoom? Are you using other platforms for training, or is it more voice nets on our actual training that's happening? Okay, good point. For the training, um, we're not allowed since last March to come together as a unit and train close together. However, there are some units throughout the country that train at a distance, and that's what ham radio is all about. They're not all sequestered. And these are great live training exercise where uh, they're introduced to a situation and on purpose, uh, uh, other hams will make noise in the background. So training is so critical, yet we meet once a month right here on Zoom and wow, out of nowhere, Zoom has become such a staple for uh, those of us in training. But teaching classes, um, it's pretty boring on Zoom. Nothing beats a live uh, pickle on fire or <laughs> making uh, a, a bicycle tuned up with a swan uh, manual tuner. Nothing beats that excitement as a live class. So we're hoping to get back to live classes sometime next year. And uh, we have a website uh, called Ham Instructor, all one word, dot com. Haminstructor.com. Not my website, but one that I've written all of the uh, training manuals for the three levels of USA licensing. Technician for the beginner license, general that adds all of the HF bands, and extra class that adds a little bit more elbow room on the bands, plus CW exclusive for extra down the bottom 25 kilohertz, plus extra class hams can form a team of three and do all examinations that they then send in to a coordinator that then can get them a license within about a week's time, pretty fast for the license. Great stuff, great stuff. Um, Elwin uh, asks here, with things like the new Rattles or uh, RT97 briefcase portable repeater, uh, are such things viable for use in emergency radio support? You know, the portable 
make your own sort of repeater sort of things? Is there many amateurs that are, are doing that over there or? Um, there are a few amateurs that will set up their two meter for 40 megahertz in the cross band, but only a few in that uh, the cross band rules uh, for the cross band device itself identified are not well defined. And uh, when crossband repeaters start popping up, you hear a vacuum in the background or uh, kids cry, you know that, oh, somebody left it on crossband and it's sort of a problem. But we do have ham radio operators that have portable repeaters. In fact, our American Radio Relay League actually will issue up to, um, I think they have a total of 50 uh, donated by, I believe it's ICOM America, as well as Kenwood Corporation, uh, and, and Yezu as well for their digital fusion system. And the ARRL on a widespread emergency will make that equipment available to their accredited amateur radio emergency service trained volunteers. And that's, uh, that's where we're really separating the wannabes from those that really will knuckle down and serve our uh, amateurs country. And that is they've got to take uh, numerous classes of uh, training at the federal level, at the state level, at the city level. All of these are courses on the internet that they take and have to pass before they are issued their emergency communications card from our ARRL, similar to your RSGB. Fantastic, great. Um, so one of the other questions here, John, uh, Mike India 6 X-Ray Golf Zulu asks, uh, could you touch a wee bit on the MURS, the Mike Uniform Romeo Sierra system, and how it briefly works? Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, is it MERS, Mike Uniform Romeo Sierra, or Mike Echo? Yeah, Romeo? Mike Mike Uniform, the MERS, yeah. Um, uh, all right, let me think about that. We have a MERS radio band. MERS for the USA, I'm familiar with, is multiple use radio system. And that is a low power, uh, no more than a couple of watts, at about 150 megahertz, that anyone may stay in touch with anyone else. But I'm not sure uh, that's what uh, your viewer or listener is speaking of, you may want to ask him a little bit more detail about that word mirrors. But we do have five VHF, around 150 megahertz, for MERS operation, and no license is needed. And you can do tone, CTCSS. Uh, I think it's strictly FM of uh, five kilohertz and two and a half kilohertz, uh, but it's an ideal set of communications, but only in the United States. I don't believe it's allowed outside of this country, if, if that is what he's talking about. Yep, yeah, I'm getting the thumbs up, so that, that is exactly it, Cory. Um, okay, anyone else, any final questions there or any questions for Gordo? No, I think we're good. Okay, well, I would like to uh, thank uh, all of you uh, for uh, coming uh, today to this uh, uh, great uh, Zoom uh, session. And uh, for all the countries that uh, we all live in, let's just hope that we're going to be able to uh, get over uh, this uh, COVID uh, epidemic that is uh, just uh, uh, sweeping around. The Mid-Ulster Amateur Radio Club, thank you specifically for this invitation. And those of you listening, uh, if you are interested in some of these sound bites, they are all available at the following website, and you go to the website and you download where it says download one hour audio. Uh, many of these calls are there, and that site to go to is W5YI, Whiskey Figure 5, Yankee India 
dot org o r g w phi y i dot org you'll see a menu on the left hand side and about six down it says download audio and we have audio of these vhf outtakes for technician audio for these emergency calls on hf and extra class we have more technical audio with many of these outtakes and many more that you've not even heard to hear today on all three and they're free of charge to download so any of my talk this morning uh, feel free to share it and uh, i just wish you all to be safe and we're all in this together and I sure hope to meet you on the band and sweepstake conditions weren't the best. So uh, coming to Utah might not have been fruitful, but uh, by golly, I heard a lot of your stations on the air. So back to you for a final and then I'll go QRT. Okay, Gordy, it's been fantastic to have you along. Uh, we've loved listening to you. Uh, I'm already getting comments and everything else and it's been a fantastic uh, talk. Uh, so glad you could take the time out uh, and the time difference worked, which was even better. It, it worked out for us. So from all of us here at the team, uh, thank you very much. Uh, if you're watching us live here uh, or on our YouTube channel, uh, we'll be have that uploaded in a couple of days. Go to under our YouTube channel there. So uh, feel free to catch up then. And do definitely share this uh, and uh, let's uh, make it uh, be seen by all of us uh, around uh, the different countries. Very worthwhile. Thanks again, Goro, uh, from all of us here at the Tuesday Night Lecture Series team. 73, this is WB6 November, Oscar Alpha, out.